In Luke chapter 17, Jesus discusses the coming of the Son of Man and the day of the Son of Man. Further, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus discusses the judgment of nations. This is an essay on the Last Judgment. As a child, I was always troubled by the concept of eternal damnation because of failure to be baptized and not believing and having faith in God. At the age of 38, I formally joined the Catholic Church and was confirmed. For me, this occurred in the year 2002. I've learned many things subsequent to my confirmation. One is that the triune God is something that mankind will never fully understand. In fact, I greatly admire how Father Barron describes this in his mini-series titled Catholicism. Additionally, the Catechism says that God transcends all creatures. We must, therefore, continually purify our language of everything in it that is limited, image-bound, or imperfect, if we are not to confuse our image of God, the inexpressible, the incomprehensible, the invisible, the ungraspable, with our human representations. Our human words always fall short of the mystery of God. With this, the question still looms in my heart, must you believe in, a, in the triune God? Must you participate in the sacraments of the church? Must you pray in the manner your catechism teacher taught you? Would a just and loving God send someone who failed to believe in that which is incomprehensible to eternal damnation? Obviously, I do not know the answer to those questions. This essay is an attempt to convey poetically my understanding of what the poetry of the Gospels convey about the teachings of Jesus Christ. Interestingly, if you read the Gospels closely, Jesus does not speak about life after death very frequently. He does speak frequently about how to live and about certain attributes that will cause his kingdom on earth to live until the end of days. I believe when he speaks thusly, he is referring to his church and how it can survive into posterity. I know many Christians will immediately refer to the letters written by St. Paul. My response to that is, we should take St. Paul's writings in context and remember, St. Paul was generally addressing first-generation Christian communities that do not have the privilege of a cultural foundation based on Judaism. St. Paul's first and primary objective was to convert polytheists into monotheists, and in doing so, also convey that God was something they would never fully comprehend. As Christian communities mature, I believe they are required to consider not only St. Paul's letters, but also what we refer to as the Catholic letters, and of course the Gospels. What follows is my essay on the Last Judgment. The Jewish Apocalypse promises for the final day a great rally of Israelites from all parts of the earth. Coming in cars, driven by the wind, they will share in the millennium of peace and prosperity, of spiritual and material delights to be inaugurated around Jerusalem. In the eschatological predictions that Jesus made about the future, there is a total lack of nationalistic or hedonistic illusions. Around the judge are summoned all human beings. Souls are reunited to their bodies through the resurrection of the body. This is the truth that Jesus enunciated in his words to Martha, the dogma he had defended against the Sadducees. The visible second coming of Christ on earth will happen suddenly, in the manner of the flood which he broke from heaven, while men were eating, drinking, and enjoying themselves, oblivious of Noah's admonitions and preparations. The cataclysm of water fell, and they were carried off in the whirlpool. Or again, it will be like the punishment that rushed on the pleasure-loving men when Lot was leaving Sodom. 
They were rejoicing and hoarding money, building houses and planting vineyards as though they would never die. But the heavens rained fire and sulfur, which burned men and devoured their works. The same thing will happen at the second coming of the Son of Man. For this reason, this last coming will not be in the manner of exhortation and instruction like the first. Rather, it will be a definite and exterminating punishment. Remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife, fleeing with her husband and two daughters from the city that was consumed under the rain of brimstone and fire, transgressed the command of the angel. She looked back to see the smoking walls as though she regretted losing the comforts of that place. In punishment, she was changed into a pillar of salt. In our revolutionary endeavor, by which we flee from death and tend to the kingdom of God, no one can look backward. He who does so, after having put his hand to the plow, is lost. We ought to fling ourselves into the work of spreading the gospel, as into a battle, without hesitating or counting what we must leave. To lose one's life is to find it, or to keep it is to lose it. At that time, and precisely in that eschatological night, mankind shall be split asunder. Of two men in the fields, one shall be taken, the other left. Where, Lord? asked the disciples, who imagined the sight of that cosmic upheaval. Jesus gave a short and obscure answer in the form of a proverb. Wherever the body is, there will eagles be gathered together. The body signifies Christ crucified, who shall then come again in power. Where Christ is, there will be his faithful, gathered like a flock, around a loving shepherd. Justice shall be done to all men. The conclusion of the story of man shall be a final divine judgment. The need for justice, which is alive in every soul, will receive full satisfaction. To each man will be given his due by a verdict at once individual and collective. By it, men will be divided into two enormous categories, the just and the damned. The Son of Man, who came first as teacher, savior, and physician, shall then rise as judge. His kingdom of love on earth will be concluded by justice. This ought to strengthen the faith of those who await him. Jesus related in a parable how a widow prevailed over a selfish judge, and feared not God nor regarded men. She obtained her justice because he feared her continual pleading. How much more will God, the just judge, render justice to his elect at their solicitation? I say to you that he will quickly revenge them. The idea of suddenness in the coming of Christ for the particular and for the general judgment is illustrated by the parable of the ten virgins, who went to meet the bridegroom with the lamps in their hand. Five of them were prudent, took oil with them. Five were foolish and went unprovided. As the bridegroom was late in coming, they fell, fell asleep. At midnight a cry went up. The foolish virgins, however, were obliged to try to borrow oil from their companions, who answered, Lest there may not be enough for us and for you, go rather to those who sell it and buy some for yourselves. At such an hour, it was not easy to buy oil. In the meantime, the nut nuptial cortege arrived. The prudent virgins joined them and entered the marriage hall. Then the door was shut. When the foolish virgins arrived, all out of breath, they cried, Sir, sir, open the door for us. And he answered, I do not know you. Hence the need of being ready and provided beforehand with deeds of light. In scripture, 
the Lord is often represented as a bridegroom, the church as a bride. This symbol honors matrimony, escorted by virginity, lending the light. Thus, the lesson of the final end of man's history is a social lesson as well. When the Son of Man shall come in his majesty, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and before him will be gathered all the nations. Millions of human beings shall for the first and last time gather in one place. They shall come from all places and from all times, so that the glory and shame shall be universal. Humanity will be brought together to give an account. It will be made into one supreme court. Michelangelo has powerfully depicted this moment in which Christ, with a terrible gesture of his right hand, separates men as a shepherd separates the lambs from the goats. To those on the right, to the just, he shall say, Come, blessed of my Father, take possession of the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, naked, and you covered me, sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Ordinarily, the Son of Man meets us on the roads of this world, under the guise of suffering brothers. In a certain sense, they are Christ continuing to suffer. He is no longer visibly in our midst. He appears in the likeness of our neighbor. Every one of our brothers at the same moment of life is in need. The neighbor is given us to represent God, to give us an occasion to show indeed the love we owe to Christ. He is the eldest brother, identified with all other brothers, great or little. In their persons, he himself receives the good or evil done to them. Thus, the good deed is made eternal. It is raised to the value of a loan to the Son of God. Truly, divinity is veiled under humanity. In a certain sense, divinity is continually incarnated in man. And so, our dealing with our neighbor, particularly the lowly, ought to be steeped in reverence, in ready service, in brotherly intercourse, almost in an act of worship. Similarly, the king, the indignant judge, shall condemn to eternal fire the cursed ones who refused a piece of bread to the hungry, a glass of water to the thirsty, a room to the pilgrim, a visit to the sick, a visit to the prisoner. These refusals were made to the Son of Man who suffers in the members of suffering humanity, members in his mystical body, the church. The just shall go to eternal life, the wicked to eternal death. The drama of earthly life is closed. History ends and glory begins. The judgment is therefore mostly founded on the works of mercy, or as it is said today, on the works of social service. Religion avails for salvation when it serves the Heavenly Father in one's brother. Religion honors God by serving the needy. It is charity. Eternal justice rewards temporal charity. In this way, the human experiment is at the same time difficult and easy. It commands us to love God and to serve him in the brethren. This is the whole law and the prophets. All religion is condensed into this. What is called social action is not an accessory added to Christian living. It is its essence. On that final day, the judgment of Christ will be based on it. 
Christ identified himself with needy brethren. Faith and works blended together. Evangelical sociology is fused with the new theology. All this is religion in action, the march of man's charity towards the final conclusion of life. With the scene of the last judgment ended, the, con the controversy of Phariseeism, Christ concluded it victoriously. No longer disputant, he became the judge. It is he who grants salvation. He gives it as the fruit of his unique sacrifice of blood. He does not give it haphazardly, but deliberately to those who love him in deeds. His religion remains to the end very simple and easy to grasp.